Hello, everybody. I'm Jim Schleter. I'm a 1980 grad of the College of Media, and I'm a member of the University of Illinois Alumni Association Board of Directors. And I'm also privileged to serve as co-chair of the board's Alumni and Student Engagement Committee. Thank you so much for joining us for this evening's Career Connections panel. We think it's a good one. We call it From Vision to Venture, Mastering the Startup Journey. And we're looking forward to hearing from our esteemed panel in just a moment. But before we get started, I wanna briefly talk to you about some exciting things that are happening at your Alumni Association. First and foremost, we continue to see great excitement around our annual paid membership program and the premier benefits that our members receive. If you haven't done so already, I encourage you to visit uiaa.org slash membership to learn about all of our great benefits, and I hope you sign up soon. And for those of you on the webinar who may be life members of the association, please know that you have access to all of these benefits at no additional cost. We are grateful for the investment you have made in your life membership, and we honor that investment by providing you with this current package of benefits. And we also have some great opportunities for all alumni to engage with us, even those who haven't signed up for a membership yet. And in particular, we strongly recommend that you visit Illini Link at IlliniLink.Illinois.edu. When you go to Illini Link, you can create your own Illini Link profile. And if you haven't done so yet, it's really worth doing. Illini Link is our online networking and mentorship platform. And members can use the platform to connect with other Illini in every field from around the world. If you're a current student, or if you're an alumni looking to make your next move, or even just get some career advice, Illini Link is just for you. It has an algorithm-based matching system that can help you find the personal Illini connection best suited for you. For instance, with Illini Link, you can find fellow alumni to help navigate the job search process, think through a career change, move to a new city, or update your resume and prepare for that next job interview. And I think talking about Illini Link is a pretty good transition to our panel. So let's get started and have them introduce themselves. And a few ground rules here as we get started. We'll begin with a few pre-selected questions, but we would like to encourage you to participate through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And we'll try to get through as many of them as possible before we wrap up, uh, probably around the top of the hour, seven central, uh, eight Eastern, you can work the rest. So here's our first question, which is a good way to introduce our panelists. And we'll go in alphabetical order with our three panelists and we'll start with Bill Forsyth. Bill, hey Bill, hey, please tell us about yourself, including how you knew when it was time for you to become a full-time entrepreneur and how you started that transition. Well, while it might seem young com by comparison with with Ashley and Amy, it might, it might be the old the the old guy. I started my company when I was twenty nine. Uh, I'm an eighty six grad of of the Geese College of Business, um, and I was I work. My, my world is the institutional asset management world. So so uh, my focus is on big pension plans, corporate pension plans like IBM's pension plan or endowments. Univers University of Arizona is in, has an endowment. Foundations like the Rockefeller Foundation, big state pension plans like the Arkansas Teachers. So I navigate that world. And I had been at a job, uh, my, my first career, uh, my first job, I started work when I was uh, 22 out of school. And I think for me, it became clear that I wanted to start my own company for two reasons. One, I saw a way to address the need. Uh, there were a lot of very small boutique managers out that were trying to trying to attract assets to manage. They were every bit as good as the big shops. I worked for a big shop. They were every bit as good, but they just didn't have the same access to, to talent. And so I saw a need I could fill. 
maybe more importantly, um, I was, like I said, I was 29. I was married, uh, had just had her second child. And I had, I had seen uh, a lot of the people for whom I worked in my first job uh, achieve success, but they achieved the age of 55 or 60 and they missed their, they missed their entire kids' lives growing up. And so for me, it was about priorities and um, starting my own company was, was as much about prioritizing my family as it was about seeing a need uh, in the marketplace and addressing it. Thank you, Bill. Now we're going to go to Amy Marcoot. And one thing I should say is this panel really does a great job of the breadth and depth of, of entrepreneurship and what fields uh, our Illini are in, especially these three. So Amy, you're up. Yeah, hi, um, my name's Amy Marcoot and I own and operate my family's dairy farm and we built a creamery. So we are farmstead operation. We're in near St. Louis, Missouri. Um, the reason why I decided to become an entrepreneur was uh, I actually, my degree, I graduated in 2005 with a degree in kinesiology. I have a master's degree in counseling and um, I was living overseas actually, uh, working with uh, different folks and uh, my mom called to say that my parents were going to sell the farm. And I am the seventh generation of Marcoots to have Jersey cows. And if you were not from New Jersey, just to be clear, but it's actually a kind it's, it's a breed of cow, like a border collie is a breed of a dog. And so we, um, so for seven generations, my family has had Jersey cows and something just sort of struck me that it would be really sad to see our farm go. So whenever uh, we started talking to my parents about what, a, what it would look like if we decided to come back, my dad said, you need to add value to your milk or you need to become a huge dairy operation. And at that time in 2007, 2008, we saw that there was a need for, um, for people who were interested in where their food came from. And we were already a primarily grass-fed operation. So we thought adding value would be a great option for us. So it wasn't, uh, honestly, it wasn't, I didn't get a business degree. It wasn't something that I thought I would do in my life, but whenever the opportunity came up, I was very excited to uh, take over my family's legacy. An awesome story and shows the breadth and depth of what a education at Illinois can do, uh, including a kinesiologist. That, that's a, <laughs> it's a great story. Speaking of great stories, Ashley, you're up next. Hi, everybody. I'm Ashley Moy. I graduated from the College of Engineering in 2016, and I currently run CAS21, which is a medical device company. Our flagship product is creating waterproof alternatives to cast and braces for people with broken bones. I actually always knew that I wanted to run a company. I just never knew it would happen so early in my career. I actually started CAS21 while I was getting my undergrad at U of I, and I forgot that I wanted to run a company until I found my junior year of college, a letter I had written to myself as a freshman. Uh, I was at that time pursuing an academic track. I thought I might do MD or JD, maybe PhD on top of it. And I saw a letter I wrote to myself that asked myself, have you figured out what letters you want after your name yet? You're pursuing all of these different options, but right now you really want CEO after your name. So I'm glad to say that I made that a reality. That's awesome. Three, three, three great stories, and we knew they would be three great stories to share tonight. Um, I am going to uh, point some of these questions to one of the three of you to get started, but I think the first one, um, I think I'll throw it open to anyone here, um, and it's a great one. How did you go about ensuring you had all the necessary financial and legal understanding to start a success uh, to start a successful business? I can start. Go for it. I think we'll all have very different answers to this question. I uh, know. When I started the company, I was still a student at the University of Illinois. And with all my co-founders and I, we had negative net worth with all the student debt. So there was no way we were self-funding our business. We had to go out and raise institutional money. We did the whole venture capital circuit, went through angel investments. And we still work with a lot of mentors and really appreciate all the communities that we've been a part of, including one of the accelerators at the University of Illinois, to help give us the resources we needed to get started and and even continue where we are today. Let Amy go. Okay, sounds good. So um, I will say for um, my family and myself, this was a trial by fire. There wasn't actually 
a lot of, I mean, we kind of knew what we needed. Um, we have assets, we have a little bit of, of land and things like that, that we were able to use for collateral, but it was literally just going and talking to people and figuring out what the right financing option would be. Um, we didn't go and uh, get investors. We just, um, I like to say, and I tease that Beth and I, my sister and I borrowed against everything mom and dad ever worked for to build this creamery. So we just utilized uh, what we had here to finance our operation. And, and my answer is very easy, Jim, because I, we're a service organization. And so for me, the cost of getting in business was uh, office space and a, and a computer or two, I, we're, but we're highly regulated. So the harder part for me was registering with the Security, Securities and Exchange Commission and making sure we were licensed. It requires a lot of licensing from FINRA. So it was more work on our end, but it was not labor, uh, not capital intensive. So, so following on that, um, how did you all support yourself in the early days um, of the business when you weren't necessarily making a profit and you were paying down those initial costs? And again, that is a different story for all three of you. We're going the same order. Sure. So as I mentioned, we raised money from outside parties to be able to support the operations of the business, included salaries for the team. And after college, I was one of those kids that moved back in with my parents, lived in the basement <laughs> while I built up the company. Yeah, for um, me, well, we uh, sold cheese at farmer's markets. And one thing that happens with vendors at farmer's markets you, is you exchange goods for goods. And so to feed myself, uh, would you like some cheese? Yes, I would like some bread. Thank you. Um, luckily on a dairy farm, we have meat and we have cheese. And so we were able to, to um, do that. Um, but also where I'm sitting right now is actually right above the creamery. It's an upstairs. And uh, for about six months, we turned it into an apartment. And so I often joke that even though I had free rent above the creamery, rent came due every morning at 2 a.m. whenever the equipment came on downstairs. <laughs> and you don't sleep through that. So that's that's how I did it. Yeah. And for and for me, again, I, I, having started the company at the ripe old age of 29, I had had a prior, you know, my, my for the prior seven years, I'd made some money. So it was, a, you know, a bit of a gut check with with my wife, um, making sure that you know she was OK with it. But it was it, it things worked out pretty well, but we didn't have to go into debt. And so it was just a matter of. Um, leaving leanly until we started making some re revenues. And with that, we have our first question from our viewers. Uh, and it's from Jeff, who says, what tips do you have for balancing full-time work with pursuing this type of business? Um, and this Ashley, Amy, um, uh, uh, Bill, order works pretty good. <laughs> sure. We, we might mix it up later. Be ready. Okay. So I... I did the opposite of this for a while because I started my company while I was in school and some of my professors were not amused that I was already working and I was ready to drop out, um, but I still wanted to graduate and get my degree. So I, my suggestion would be to find people that can help you in both aspects. Find people you trust at work to help you with your work and find people with your side business that can help you get your side business done. And then parcel out time for in your day where you just work on either of those activities so that you are maximally productive during those times. Time management. That's great. Compartmental, uh, I can't say compartmentalize very well, but managing your time. Amy. Yeah, I mean, I didn't actually have a full time. I I quit my job. I left my career to start this. So for me, we were all in. Uh, we opened our creamery on June fifth of two thousand ten, and at that point, we had to put all of our cow's milk into cheese. We couldn't sell our milk anywhere else. And so we often say that we feel like we jumped off a cliff, and we were just hoping that it would catch on. So I. It, for me, this is where I spent about 16 hours a day for seven days a week for the first two years of the business. Yeah, and I could do that because I was 27 at the time. I couldn't do that now. <laughs> yeah. And my experience is more like Amy's in that uh, once we left the once we left the mothership and started our own little company, it was put your head down and just drive forward because plan I didn't we didn't have a plan B at the time. Plan B was asking for a job back. And so uh, it, you, I would say you're almost monomaniacal uh, in your focus uh, when you when you start a business because 
uh, you can see another way, but I would, yeah, the time management, time management is definitely important, but it's, for me, it's about anticipation. It's trying to anticipate what needs are out there in the marketplace and being ready to address them so that when they occur, you're not chasing it. I, I must tell you, we're getting a lot of great questions right now, uh, live as we go. So I'm going to do another one. Um, here's, this one's from Craig and okay, we'll start this one with Amy. How do you market your company and find customers? I, I wanted to start with you because I love the bartering story too, but yeah. <laughs> uh, how do you market your company and find customers? Yeah, you know, interestingly, uh, so I grew up on this dairy farm. I knew how to take care of animals, though I didn't think that would be my profession for my life, but we did not know how to make cheese. We hired a few consultants to help us, but still cheese making is very much a bit of a trade where you have to practice and practice because the way that, the way that you make cheese in Wisconsin is different in Illinois, especially because we're a grass-based operation. The milk changes based on the seasonality. So I'll tell you how we started. We went to farmer's markets. The first year we went to about seven farmer's markets and I tried to meet everybody I could. But how I really, what I really loved about that is that we actually would say, would you like to try a piece? And if two or three people would sit, uh, spit that piece out, I would say that's a no-go and we would go back and we would go to the drawing board and we'd say let's do something different interestingly one of the cheeses we make that we we knew we messed up on is one of our best cheeses and so it just it took practice and it took time but going and meeting people and doing direct to consumer gave us feedback on our product immediately and that helped us and then we started meeting chefs and then I did, I just would go into restaurants. It just kind of was guerrilla marketing. <laughs> I'd go into restaurants and I just asked, would you like to try our cheese? Would you like to try our cheese? And slowly we were able to build up a really nice following. Go I ahead, Bill. Okay. Um, we were a bit of an enigma. Uh, when we when we left the, the, the big company, um, getting a meeting was not difficult because people were curious why we would leave such a good company and start a, start a new company with no, you know. And so I think people were puzzled when they when they first met with us. So in terms of marketing ourselves, we had to go out and explain why we could do a better job than somebody they might, they might hire internally, and we had to make our case for we're just better. Um, and that was that was a challenge. As the, you know, we're thirty years into it, so thirty years later, we've had you know some some measure of success. And now all of a sudden people are calling us. So over that, you can imagine the transition over the years, it goes from you soliciting business to people soliciting your, your help. And so we, we're turning, you know, we're turning away far more people than we accept because um, we have to keep the quality of the, of the firms with whom we work very high, but it, it changes. It changes with, with success. I'll echo that. We also evolved our strategies to be more outbound versus inbound uh, and then uh, forward versus service providing as well as our company grew. We have a really interesting marketing play for a healthcare company, a medical device company, because we do two front marketing. So we market not just to the doctors and clinicians, medical professionals. We also do some education to the, the potential patients and the current patients as well. Great stuff. And the questions keep coming in. And, and with um, following your answers to those, here's a good one from, um, let's see. Yeah, this is from Harrison. How do you self-study and deal with slumps in motivation uh, and per perhaps during down times? And how, what subjects or things do you uh, pursue or, uh, to help you through those times, the things you really have a passion for while you're also doing your uh, doing the job. Uh, Ashley, you could start this one. Sure. So I self-study by journaling and doing something a mentor taught me called protecting your creativity. So for a few hours every week, I just pen, paper, no electronics, and just write whatever I need to get out or talk about, think about in my mind to help protect my confidence. And if I'm ever feeling kind of slumpy, I like your word there, <laughs> that usually helps me work through it and get out of it. And as far as the self-study for subjects that I otherwise had a passion for, I love music. I played in a couple of the bands at the University of Illinois. And I find people who still do enjoy music and who are also entrepreneurs. One of my fellow Illini, he runs a company called Trala. He's hosting a, like a entrepreneur friends jam night, and we're just all going to bring our instruments and play together. 
Yeah, I so, like that a lot. Uh, <laughs> I'm a musician too. <laughs> um, yeah, so for me, uh, one of the things I'm passionate about is at actually, I, because I have a degree in counseling, I love working with people and managing people is not the, doing, it's not the same as counseling people. So I actually lead a recovery group on Thursday night. So if you can imagine doing that for fun, that's something that I do for fun, but it is actually really life giving to me because it's something that I really enjoy. Um, the other thing is whenever there are slow times or slumps, it's hard because I get, sometimes I want to get anxious about why we need to be selling more products. Why is it slow? But like, for example, oftentimes the first two weeks of November is really slow. And what I finally have learned after about 14 years now is that it's about to get really busy. So you need to rest. And so I, what I know is that the next five, six, eight weeks are going to be incredibly busy for us. And so I actually try to take a little bit of time and just Let's go home early and take care of myself in that way. It's hard to combat the anxiety <laughs> when it's slow, but it is a real thing to know. It's okay. I mean, it's come for 14 years. It'll come again. So just rest. Excellent. Excellent. It, oh, go ahead. go ahead. Go ahead, Bill. I was going to say we're in very different industries, I'm, we're, but I would say, Amy, I'm, the, I'm in the same camp. And that is if we're having a slow period, I, I used to get stressed by it, thinking where where will the next success come from? And now I embrace it because I realize it's not going to last. So I use the time, I use that time to really think, try to think outside the box about what can we be doing for our clients that we're not. What you know, well, let's check in with them. Let's see if they're content with what we're doing. Let's and it's kind of a health and wellness check uh, while we're doing it. And in the, in the meantime, I like to read and I like exercise, and so I kind of use it as a time to flush. Because I, as you say, it's it's going to change, and so uh, yeah. embrace the quiet for a while. And and um, I I have to follow up with Amy. We've got we received a comment from Sandra, who says that uh, she buys the Marcout Creamery cheese at Schnooks in the St. Louis area, and says the cheese curds are delicious. Thank um, you. Yeah, we, we we all know that, um, but it's great to it's great to see the comments here online. Hey, we have one from Antarkesh. Could you talk about the mindset you have when pivoting from the full-time job, wherever you were, or in perhaps in Ashley's case, student, full-time student, to that entrepreneur thinking, you know, you've had it, you have a, a in, in a couple of cases, you might have a definitive salary. Uh, you've got all that um, stability, perhaps that you're going into this new area. That just the the mindset. How, what are you thinking about? Bill, go ahead. Uh, what I'm thinking about. Well, again, I, in setting up the the guidelines and rules for 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 our company, I've really tried to think about what is it. How is it I want to be treated? And I I hated the fact that one person determined. My the vast majority of my compensation would used to come in via bonus at the end of the year. You'd make a salary, but and and you know if you had a if you had a an issue two weeks before bonuses came out, you might be dinged. I would say maybe you know uh, disproportionately for the year. And so I I really hated that part of the compensation. So when we started the company, we 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 created an environment where um, salaries are not huge. They are enough to sustain a family, but the vast majority of the compensation is um, uncapped and it's con completely contingent upon uh, the job you do. And so politics don't play a role in, 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 in you know, face. We're not about FaceTime in the, in, in, in the office. It's all about being productive and getting your job done. So we like to treat people like adults, which is the way I wanted to be treated. And so that's what, that's the way I approach compensation. I would think about mindset when you're going to do something all on your own to bet on yourself, be abundance mindset instead of want mindset and think about having almost a, a cavalier sense of confidence going forward uh, because you're about to trust yourself and put your future in your own hands. Yeah, and for me, whenever I went from making a salary to taking over everything here, um, it it was a bit of a shift. I mean, it was to um, move above the creamery, and but for me, it was about the greater good of what we can create and also um, our family's legacy. And so it's just uh, waking up 
every day and you're not going to quit. And I mean, sure, I get tired and I have to take breaks, you know, burnout is real. It's a real thing. But at the same time, I just, we're not going to quit. We are going to figure this out. And every day that's what we wake up and we're okay. We're going to figure this out. And that's how we go about our days. Excellent. Okay. We have one that we received earlier. Um, how do you handle, this is a good one. I, I, I find this one fascinating myself. How do you scale your business? Uh, you know, how do you handle that? You're, you're seeing that growth, but then how do you plan for the future? Like, okay, we're seeing this much come in. Now we can invest either in more people, uh, we can grow. And, and, and how do you make those decisions? I, I always take it. Uh, I used to cover the track team in Illinois when I, when I was at the daily Illini and, um, the high jump coach said, you know, a big, um, a big hurdle, hurdle, a, a big milestone to get over is to be able to jump over the, how high, how tall you are. That when you look at that bar, if you're six feet tall, you got to be able to jump over six feet. And I, and I equate that to this question here. How do you scale up and say, okay, we're going to get bigger. And that's what it takes. Go, Amy, I'll start. You start. Yeah, sure. So because we manufacture our own product, it's, uh, it definitely is an interesting thing. Uh, well, I'm really grateful The my other partners are Audie, who is a U of I grad too. She has a degree in industrial design. Her jobs were initially in design engineering. So she designed hurdles for Gill Athletics. Um, and then Audie, or Beth, who's my sister, and she runs our farm. And Beth's degree is from the College of Bases at the University of Illinois as well. And um, Audie, with her engineering mind, she's also a helicopter pilot. So she's the coolest out of all of us. Uh, but she... Um, with her engineering mind, I'll say, okay, Audie, hey, um, we're hearing from Petco because uh, ironically, we sell more dog treats than we do anything else, which if you want to ask me about that 14 years ago, I would have said you're crazy. But but um, I, 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 Audie, we're about to go into Petco. They're going to put us in X amount of stores and they're going to take this many SKUs. We need to make this in 30 days. How do we do this? And luckily she'll come and say, okay, I mean, it's okay. I, I have these pieces of equipment that we can purchase whenever it's necessary. Once we get a PO, we can do this. And she already has it planned out how we can scale up. Sometimes we have to wait till we fill the first PO to be able to do those things. But it is important that we kind of have a vision for if we, when we get to this level, we need this equipment. We need this many people. Whenever we get to this level, this is what we need. And we always are thinking about that. We always are thinking about what's next. Go ahead, Bill. Uh, for us, it's really about bandwidth. And, and we, we, you know, our clients are all discrete entities based, some in the US, some in the UK, some in Australia. And so uh, we, we, we also know the, 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 the addressable market in the US. There are lots of, lots of consulting firms, lots of plans. And so um, you have to balance that versus managing a group of 20 people. And so for, for, for me, I'm always asking the question about bandwidth. Are we adequately servicing the number of clients we have? If we want to add a client, it likely means we have to add another professional or two. Um, and so for me, it's, and, and by the same token, you also may have to make sure that you are providing each and every client your very best. Every, you know, everybody has to be hitting on all cylinders. So for me, it's less about... Uh, the, the issues Amy faces are more about what can we do and, and how many clients can we serve and keep our professionalism as high as it was 30 years ago. Partnerships are really key for us when we think about scaling to address both of the things that Amy and Bill were saying when it comes with bandwidth for people or machinery. We heavily rely on people in our ecosystem to help us achieve those next milestones. I'll do a follow-up question. Does does the uh, does the question ever come up, or or what what's in your head when you think, okay, how do you have a like a a, a limit or a, a cap? Of how far do we grow? Um, in 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 all of these cases, like, well, okay, we could just keep getting clients, or we could just keep. We see there's an addressable market or out there. The partnerships. Um, it, it's that. It's that need to kind of, do you have to make sure you don't overgrow or what's your, what's your big strategic yeah. vision for the organization? I'll jump in. And I, I don't, I, I don't think, I think of this with regard to frontier partners, but I also think I sit on a, a number of boards and uh, of, of some, of some not-for-profits 
and they're always asking the question about growth. Every not-for-profit I've ever worked with wants to grow. And I and I keep telling them growth for growth's sake is not the end goal. If you can keep the it needs to be growth while keeping the quality of what you're delivering the same. You have to do both. If one suffers, it can all fall apart. Anyone else? Hey, yeah, I would say Oh, you go, Ashley. Go ahead. Well, I guess we'll just keep the order going then in a second here. <laughs> Good. Good deal. Um, with growth and how do we think about who wants to do it, how much do we grow? Growing from one to zero, one to a hundred, hundred to thousand and thousand to million, million to a billion, uh, there's all very different sets of challenges and opportunities that come with them. So we take gut checks all the time internally, discuss mission and what the goals, short-term, long-term, mid-term are, and make sure that we have the right team in place to meet the goal for whatever the next milestone is. Yeah, that was very well said, Ashley. Um, I, I think that that's right. I, I tell people whenever you want to go to the next level, like you said, Ashley, it's almost like for us anyway, it's like startup again, <laughs> where we're trying to figure out, and it's not the same, it's different every single time, but it, it does sort of have that feeling and that culture, you know, about this is what we're trying to accomplish now. But yeah, I mean, for sure, there's a limit to where, where our facility is not going to be able to handle beyond this amount. You know, we can go to two shifts, we can do this, but we also really love to give our employees a good quality of life too. So how do we do this with all of that in mind? There's something that um, one of my mentors keeps telling me, I mean, it's more than just profitability, it's also social collateral. And so how do we become good um, stewards in our community too? How do we serve the people that, and it's not, it's just about using what we have to, I mean, to do good things. Yeah. and to to be proud of who we are and what we're doing. So um, I, I think it's bigger, it, but it's all of those things. And Ashley makes a good point. If I could just underscore one thing she said, uh, and I, I, I guess with my experience, we worked with a manager in the small cap space, which was back in 2000, was a very hot asset class. And it took us three years to get that manager its first $100 million of assets. And it took us one year to get the next billion. <laughs> so it, it, the, the, the amount of work is often disproportionate. Often it gets a lot easier. The bigger you get, it can get easier counterintuitively. Yes. And also not those challenges at those different levels don't entertain everybody as well. So as the company continues to grow, as I mentioned, that's where we check in with who's still here and are you motivated by the challenges ahead of you? Ooh, that, that leads into a great question from Nikon. Um, how do you keep the team incentivized other than through salary in order for them to share the company vision and remain loyal through uh, everything getting started and, and growing? Let's see. We'll go right back to Ashley. Sure. So I think there are a lot of different things that we could do to incentivize team. I, I'll give a broad and a narrow Overall, I think it's very important for people to have buy-in in your vision and mission. And that starts with hiring the people who already share that desire to, to achieve whatever it is your company is doing together. And then on the narrow side, it takes a lot of work, but part of being a great manager is understanding what makes the people on your team tick. Are they uh, incentive motivated? Are they motivated or are they... Uh, punishment motivated, as we say, whip carrot, um, really figuring out what it is that that person needs to feel like they're seen and appreciated. Maybe instead of bonus, uh, you like buy them an Hermes scarf after they hit like a really big client or something like that. Uh, so I would say having good team relations will help uncover what needs to be offered as that incentive. Sometimes a good round of golf after you make a sale is like what that person really wanted. Yeah, I would echo that. Um, you know, our the people that work for us, they're not, uh, nobody grew up in Greenville, Illinois, thinking that they were going to make cheese for a living, including myself. Um, it just, 
it's not a thing around here. And so the people that we hire are often people that are just honestly looking for a job. And we try to, you know, give people livable wages. Uh, but for us, it's about, uh, we check in with our people every day. I mean, we, we're honestly working with them most of the time. And hey, I, I noticed something's going on. Are you doing okay? We, we, I don't want to say we become friends or family because it's a little difficult whenever you're managing people, but we do actually really care about our people. I tell you the best thing to motivate our people is whenever we make them lunch. And I mean, it's, it seems simple. But we see them, we care about them, and we will make them lunch and we'll bring it over. We actually got in trouble during COVID because we had all of our employees sit out on the picnic tables and somebody thought we were having a gathering. And we were allowed to continue working together because we were making food, you know. But we were, no, no, we're, we were all together anyway. But just making them lunch. I mean, just letting them know, I see you, I care about you, I really appreciate you, thank you. I would agree with both of what they said, but I won't, I won't reiterate that. I, with, with our folks, uh, you know, we recognize big anniversaries with gift cards for restaurants downtown that they can take their spouse, uh, things like that. Um, I guess by and large, I, I'd say we dress it two ways. One is, as I mentioned, compensation for them is completely, almost completely contingent on, on, on their work. It's conditioned on, on what they put into it. So they, they, uh, compensation is not capped. So, um, their efforts will will pay out, uh, pay off to them directly. Uh, and second, maybe more importantly, is may, may, we're probably a little ahead of our time. I've always because because family is a priority for me. I've always told uh, the folks that work here that family should be priority for them. So any day that their child is in a holiday pageant or there was somebody sick, um, we just tell them stay home or go go do that. That is you, you know, and you'll get your job done that night or the next day. But I think treating people with the respect and giving them the, the flexibility to address their personal needs, knowing that they will take care of their professional needs. No one's ever taken advantage of that to always put us in pretty good stead. Yeah, our, our next, that's great stuff. Our next question comes from, uh, well, I don't have a name on it. It's an anonymous attendee, but we're glad they're with us. Is um, how do you make sure that you're evolving and staying ahead of the trends in your respective industry? And I think that's a really good question, given by the nature of 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 what you all do. You have perhaps smaller staffs. Uh, you don't have folks out there doing competitive research like at, at the big place that I worked. Um, so how do you do that? And 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 where do you go and make sure that's part of your business plan? Go ahead, Amy. You could start. Sure. Yeah. One of the things I learned really quickly was uh, this is where my counseling degree came in handy. Was I just need to listen to people. Instead of going in and talking to a chef and saying, this is what you need because this is what I have, I would say, well, what do you need? Is there a gap in the market here? And um, one of the things that we saw, I mean, I mentioned that we sell pet food. Uh, the way we got into that is people started coming into the creamery and they were asking for whey, which is part of making cheese. You have curds and whey. Um, they were asking for whey for their dogs. And at that point, we we're like, okay, hold on. What's the research here? What's going on? But we just saw people coming in and we were paying attention. And we're like, what do you use it for? Is it helping? Is it actually beneficial? And that's what sort of drew us into the pet market a little bit. And then during COVID, we had already started producing um, uh, pet. We had started researching, researching and developing pet products, but we hadn't released it yet. And whenever we lost about 70% of our business overnight, because of all the restaurant closures and universities shut down, I'm like, I'm so glad we're diversifying our markets. <laughs> and we continued on with that. So we paid attention, we talked to people. I mean, even our pet products, we went to buyers and said, what do you like and what don't you like? Is there actually a need for this? And tell us, just tell us. And if there's not, no problem. Uh, but just listening to people for me has been a really, really huge thing. I'll jump in because I'm just going to second that. I'm, I I don't have a lot of skills, but listening is one of them, is one of the few skills I have. And so listening is very important. And leveraging your network. And again, Amy alluded to that indirectly, but over the years, you develop a network of trusted contacts and to to ask them that, you know, what are they seeing in the marketplace? What are they what are they hearing from friends? Uh, could you make this introduction to me? I, I understand this person does a really good job of this. You know, I know you know them. Would you be kind enough to make an introduction? But listening is, is I would say, maybe the most underutilized asset in most people's arsenal. 
I'm going to add on to the listening aspect by say, put yourself in places where you can hear the good conversations. And as Bill mentioned, leverage your network. A lot of the times it's difficult to learn what's really going on at companies because there are side conversations at board meetings, or maybe it's a R and D teams working on something and it never made it into the earnings call. But if you go to conferences, hang out at industry networking events, a, Pick up, use this as a great example or excuse to like go play pickleball and just ask the person next to you, like, what are they doing? And you'd be surprised how much people are willing to tell you if you just ask. Yeah, yeah, I think, um, I think sometimes we use the word, we all use the word networking so much, it almost becomes a buzzword that just kind of goes over one's head instead of really thinking what that means. And making connections with people and 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 finding out what they do and what they need and all that. Th th those are all great answers. Here's another great question from Anonymous. It is a second good one in a row from Anonymous. Is there anything that you wish you would have known earlier for being an entrepreneur or starting an entrepreneurship or company? Uh, Bill, we'll start with you. Oh, boy. I'm going to have to think about that. Um, I put you on the spot. Yeah. Uh, what do I wish I would have known? There's a lot I don't know, but in, in terms of, um, yeah, I would say, I would say, uh, was it a blind spot? What were the blind spots for me? Um, you, you, you often don't know what you don't know. And so I guess the blind spots for me, maybe what I, what I wish, you know, I, I, I like it. It's a crystallized intelligence versus fluid intelligence. I think it's the three of us, and especially especially Ashley and Amy, you know, started companies at very young ages. And I would say it's it's unusual to start a company at a young age because you're in the what I would call the fluid intelligence stage where you're learning information. It's it's easier when you have you know when you when you're have thirty years of experience to look back and say. Um, you're using your crystallized intelligence as, as more of a catalog. So um, I guess maturity and, and avoiding hubris, you got to make sure you avoid hubris because I think the people that get in trouble are those, are those that think they have all the answers. And again, don't, don't listen and um, move forward without really judging whether, whether or not they're making the right move. I have two things that I wish I would have known, or in hindsight, potentially could have done, or wish could have been done differently. And I thought of it, Bill, when you mentioned that fluid intelligence, because I started my company when I was like 20 or 21 years old. I have learned so much, not just about running a business in the past, but 10 years, but also about myself. And as I'm growing as a, as a human and learning my own leadership and management styles, that was certainly a learning curve. And I was building the airplane as I was flying it. So thank you to my entire team for their patience <laughs> as I was doing that. Uh, the other thing that I, I wish I would have told myself earlier that it's okay to define success for myself, especially because we went out and raised venture capital and I was still in school at the time. So I was so used to people saying like, this is what you need to get an A on this assignment, or this is what's expected of your company in terms of growth and profitability and profit margins and timelines. And running a company is actually the first time that I had the opportunity to define success for myself and I didn't take it soon enough. Um, yeah, so I think I, you know, I, I, I'm like Ashley, we're and probably Bill as well, where we were all probably building the airplane as we went. Uh, I, I would say that um, probably the biggest thing for me, I, I, and I didn't know what I didn't know either. I always thought that we could do this. I, I, my first answer actually to the question was, I wish I would have known how to make cheese, <laughs> but um, <laughs> we learned. Um, but Really, though, uh, you know, everything that we I know about business, I learned the hard way. And it wasn't because I was trying to be stubborn or difficult or anything like that. But I just, oh, that doesn't work. Let's try it like this. OK, this works. Let's move forward. And I think um, the one thing that at, 20, at 41 today, if I could have told myself at 27 is you can do this. 
don't quit, which I wasn't, I knew I could do it. I wasn't going to quit, but there were days whenever I'm like, I don't think I could do this. And, but you can, you just have to keep going. You have to keep trying until you figure it out. And eventually, I mean, you're going to figure it out. And the, but the thing is, is that you never figure it out. That's the other thing. You're always, always, always learning something new. And that's how we kind of stay ahead of the curve. And we try to anticipate what's happening next in the marketplace and things like that. But, but it's both of those things, I would say. I, I am hearing, I, for the last 45 minutes, I've been hearing a lot of wisdom. And I, I, I'm glad that this uh, uh, program is being recorded because I got a lot of notes to take uh, after we're done with this. Uh, and I hope other people realize too, it's recorded and, and will be uh, it will be available. Um, let's see, there's two questions from Karnik and I think I'm gonna split them because they're a little bit different and I don't wanna ask him, uh, have you get, uh, answer two at the same time. The first one is, how do you know that this is the, and the word the is capitalized like the Ohio State University, which I really don't get, but how do you know that this is the problem you want to solve in terms of starting a business? You, you, you all have talked about that a little bit. You saw your niche, but what was like the process to, to say, yep, that's what, where we're going for? Uh, Amy, you go first. Yeah. So for us, it, I'll be honest, I tell my employees, like sometimes they drop a piece of cheese or something like that. And I'll be like, guys, it's okay. It's just cheese. I mean, yeah, it pays our bills, but it's just cheese. Like we're not going to, or my sister, we joke about um, not crying over spilled milk, literally. And so, I mean, it's, it, it's, you know, uh, I'm sorry. Can you ask the question again? I was getting distracted. Yeah. Yeah. How, how do you know the that this is problem the solved. problem? Yes. Thank you. I thank you very much. So the the problem that we were trying to solve is how do we sustain our seven generation dairy farm? That's the problem. And so cheese is just the route that we're doing it. And I love cheese. I still love cheese today. But regardless, I oddly I don't like milk though. I do, will not drink a glass of milk, but I'll eat all the cheese. Tell a dairy farmer that their daughter is not going to drink milk. It was a hard one to swallow, but cheese will eat. I, I will. I do like that. But the problem that we were trying to solve is how do we sustain our seven generation dairy farm? I don't have kids. My sister has three little boys. How do we sustain it? So if, if the eighth generation would like it, they would have the opportunity to take it because it was going to go away. Like so many other small farms have gone away. So cheese is just our vehicle to do it. Dog treats, dog cheese, dog ice cream. That's our vehicle to sustain our small dairy farm. How did I know I wanted to solve it? Because I wanted to sustain our, our dairy farm. So that's how I knew. I'm gonna give a softer answer uh, than, than Amy's. And that is the, the problems or the problem that we face at any one time changes by the month, changes by the year. And, and how do I know it's the one? Because it's the one I think about when I wake up at 4 a.m. and I try to solve it. And I, when I'm running, I'm thinking about it. That's how I know it's the problem to solve. I love that. And I guess I, I may have an opposite answer. I don't think I'm solving the problem. I hope that I have many more companies in me in my lifetime and that I'll continue to solve problems that I'm really excited to tackle. And here's the second one. Uh, from Karnik, how do you find the right partners? And are there any Illini groups or Illini connections that you have? I, I'll jump in. Uh, there are no Illini con groups. With, with our, our, our business is so niche. There, it really doesn't lend itself to an Illini group. Um, I, I would simply say for me, finding the right partners is more about cultural fit than anything else. You need technical expertise. You want to make sure that they know, you know, they're, they're competent, but beyond competence, because we have a small company, uh, really cultural fit and, and working together as a team, the right mentality is far more important than anything else. I would, and I'll add one more thing. I would, um, and I've said this to a lot of people, I don't, I, I, I think GPA was is kind of a, a a decent barometer, but I would much rather find the B or C student that works their butt off than the A student that can't I can't identify with and doesn't connect with people. So you know, and that goes to again personality and cultural fit. I agree with that, and I would encourage anybody looking to add partners to look in some unorthodox places. So, for example, one of my favorites is garbage companies will sometimes put 
help wanted ads in gyms because they need people who either wake up really early or go to bed really late and don't mind physical activity. So be creative about figuring out what the skill set or the mindset is that you are trying to fill on your team and then go there to find that partner. And as far as Illini groups, uh, I would apply that same mentality to that uh, uh, opportunity and also say that uh, I started my company at the university. So I, I met my story I love to tell my co-founder and my husband at the same party at U of I. So wow. just go to more U of I parties. <laughs> yeah. Um, for me, it was a, a, a right, the right partners, the no, Audie and Beth. Um, Beth is my sister. So this is her family's farm too. And Audie has been my best friend since I was 10 years old and she was raised on a farm a little bit north of here. And so for us, we all had a desire and a passion to continue our small family farms and to see them grow and flourish and maybe uh, become better because of that. So it was just, it was literally just a vision and we came together with that. And I don't think that there's any Illini groups that I am aware of. Okay, here's one uh, that I'm really looking forward uh, to hear your thoughts on. <laughs> I almost laugh reading it. What does a typical day as a business owner look like? And I will start with Ashley. Yeah, typical day. Um Wake up in the middle of the night thinking about something that needs to get done for that day or that week. Trying to go back to bed. Getting up. <laughs> uh, preparing my morning routine. Sometimes that involves exercise. Uh, meetings in the morning and then work throughout the day. And then meetings in the afternoon through the night. Uh, and then uh, press PR marketing activities uh, before I go to bed. Family time gets in there somewhere. Yeah, so for us, there's a lot of, um, I say my job is, and I'm sure everybody else's as well, but it's very organic in nature. So I can know, okay, I've got a meeting at 10, a meeting at noon, a meeting at two. But what I try to do is I, whenever I get to work, I try really hard to get all the things I know I have to get done just as fast as I can, because I don't ever know for sure if my sister is going to call and say, Amy, I'm, I'm having trouble with a cow. Uh, she's calving and it's not going very well. Will you come out and help me? <laughs> and or there's a lot of organic things that happen that I can't that are just out of my control. So if I can get my work done, the things I know I need to get done first thing in the morning, I feel like I have the day um, to be able to do all the things that I are completely out of my control, but very important for our operation. Yeah, and I would say for for me, typical day is an oxymoron. Uh, there is no there is no such thing as a typical day. It's every day is different, which which is to me part of the draw. Uh, I love my job because it's you know it it offers such a wide variety. I travel a fair amount as you can imagine. I, uh, there might be a two week stretch where I'm going from Seattle to San Francisco to Los Angeles to Austin to Tallahassee to New York to Boston back to Chicago. Uh, and, 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 and then, and then two weeks in the office and maybe I, I'm, I'll be in, I'll be in, I'll be in Australia for a week with clients in early December. But, uh, before that there, after that, there's not much travel. So yeah, it's, there's no such thing as a typical day. It's, it's very interesting, very, it's variable, which I enjoy. Uh, th those are really great and interesting answers. Again, coming from someone who spent his career in the corporate world. Um, like I said before, I'm taking lots of notes. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, I might throw one more in there for the good of the Illini, but um, I think our, our, our last question is, you know, who, who were your mentors? And not in particular people, actually, or names, but who are the folks that you look to, the types of folks that, that you went to for guidance and, and you knew they were there in your corner and, and helped you? Um, Bill, I'll start with you. Uh, I, so I'll give you, um, I'll, I'll give you two answers. One, one from the very beginning, uh, actually in Alina, and I'll, I'll name him because, uh, he's deceased, but was a wonderful guy. His name is Gar Gardner Heydrich. And he was one of the founders of Heydrich and, and Struggles. So he was a, a corporate headhunter and I met him when I was at school and he was very good to me at providing advice. And he gave me a lot of mentorship. Before I started my company, he met. We met regularly for lunch when I was starting my career. 
And he just gave me, a, he was talk about wise. He was a very wise man and provided a lot of, a lot of guidance. My grandparents have been, have been very instrumental over the years. And then uh, the answer, my, my wife has been, is my, is my current day mentor. She's the one that I lean on. She's uh, a great judge of character. She doesn't know the specific ins and outs of our business, but in terms of when I have questions, when I'm wrestling with, I, I can describe her what's going on. She always gives me very good advice. My personal board of advisors has changed throughout my career with Cast 21. So as far as Illini goes, I had some fantastic advisors and professors at the university that have just been so wonderful to me during my time there when I was trying to do both school and work at the same time. Uh, I don't know that they're going to love that I'm advertising this, but they let me like take a truncated version of the course and just take the class by myself and finish the entire semester within a month so that I could focus on my company. And that's just been phenomenal uh, for me. And they taught me so much about life and work at the same time. Uh, and then beyond that, I have a lot of other colleagues that are similarly uh, started their companies uh, very young from the university. And I, I just love sharing ideas with them to this day. Yeah, and uh, for me, we have a couple different ones. Uh, one of them is uh, Heather Hampton Nodal, and she's a, a College of Aces grad. And Heather has been a huge um, just support to us whenever we have questions. And uh, she knows she works in the ag in industry. She's um, the president of uh, American Agri Women, and so she works with lobbying groups and things like that. And so whenever we're like, hey, could you give us some feedback? Will you walk around? Our farm is open to the public. Anybody can come and whenever we're open, you can come and you can see the baby calves. You can see the cows eating the grass. You can watch the cows, the robot smoking the cows. And so sometimes we just need another set of eyes walking around and seeing what other people see. Can you give us feedback? Um, and then the other uh, couple would be Jane and Tom Senior. They own Smokehouse and Annie Guns in St. Louis, and they've been in the industry a long time. And I know there's been a couple situations over the last 14 years that we run into that weren't going like we thought they would. But I always knew that I could call Jane and Tom would sit down with me. Jane and Tom would sit down. They'd buy me lunch and uh, they would say, tell us the problem. And I remember one time uh, Tom said, well, Amy, you know, you're probably going to lose about $80,000. And I said, I know, that's why I'm here. I don't know what to do. And he said, well, that's a really cheap MBA. And I thought, you know, you're right. And what he was saying is you've learned a lot through this. And so th I, I have a lot of other people that I talk to on a weekly basis or monthly basis, but those two uh, really stick out for me. Well, hey, we're, we're reaching that uh, top of the hour. Um, you know, it, it, this has been a, a wonderful time to, to hear your experiences. And like I said, your wisdom and, uh, you're, you're the three of you have different careers, different businesses. You share a wonderful thread that we call the university of Illinois and that we are alums. Um, and, and Ashley and Amy and Bill. I want to thank you for joining us today. I thought it was wonderful. I, I hope everybody who watched thought the same. And we'll be looking for more career connections in the future here at the Alumni Association. And uh, with that, we'll see you next time.